Right, so I'm going to talk to you today less about optics and now a bit more about some of the fun things we can do with liquid crystal devices, different applications, and uh, what we call nanophotonics. Now, don't be confused by people putting in the particles, tubes, buckyballs, whatever, because with crystals, this is not what I'm going to talk about. This is not doping. This is actually playing around with the device structure itself, the geometry of the device, by putting in essentially unusual shaped objects on the surfaces, pillars, etc., usually based around carbon nanotechnology, which then allows you to play with the um, physics of these things. So, as usual, my talks are pretty no frills, no maths, um, nothing too complicated, just lots of nice pictures and videos. And I'm going to talk to you today about essentially combining liquid crystals with multi wall carbon nanotubes, specifically grown on the surface to form electrodes. They change the geometry of the pixel, they allow us to create different optical effects, and maybe even something wacky like metal materials, etc., um, to get onto various band lengths. So, here's our first clickatastic question. Looks like it's ready. What is typical dimensions of a multi-wall carbon nanotube? Is it five millimeters, sorry, five nanometers diameter, hundred nanometers long, five millimeters diameter, ten meters long, fifty nanometers, five microns long, or <coughs> five hundred nanometers diameter and fifty microns long? Do you know about nanotechnology? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so we're number 40. It's number 42. Maybe it's like 43. We have a winner. All right, stop there. Have a look. Whoa. That's interesting. Ha. Caught you all out. So everyone thought, hey, five nanometers diameter. 100 nanometers long. I'm afraid that's the wrong answer. That will be a single wall carbon nanotube. <laughs> that will be essentially the smallest little roll up of carbon I could make. In fact, the right answer is the other one to see roughly 50 nanometers in diameter and 5 microns in length. They can be variable length, but that's kind of the average size. That's about 7 to 10 skins of carbon, like an onion. Um, uh, also, B. May sound stupid, but five nanometers diameter, ten meters long, has been done. In fact, they've made hundreds of meters long. Basically, you can grow them and just keep on growing them and keep on growing them. In fact, they start spinning them and making fibers out of them, all sorts of cool things like that. So it's not necessarily that stupid an answer. And also, the quite hard to get that size of uh, concentric rings of carbon. By the time you get to that kind of diameter, you've got what's called grass, which is basically a whole clump of uh, um, single wall carbon nanotubes all grown together like a sort of a a, a chunk of you know, forest of, of, of hairs. But by one single tube, multi wall, you want up to C. Not bad. Fooled you already. Give me a long talk, cats. Right, so why do I want to do this? Well, Bill Costum yesterday talked about holographic projection, and uh, what he didn't mention is that you don't have to do two dimensional holographic projection, you can do 3D holographic projection. And this is a really cheapo. Nasty holographic display. I'm going to use a really high tech pointer here. I love using a stick. So we have here a little crystal micro display, as was mentioned yesterday, and a laser illuminating it. And then we just look through a series of mirrors, none of which have smoke on them, by the way. And I see a three dimensional image. Because basically, I can diffract the light from the SLM to different positions and different angles of the eye. And therefore, I can give a fully proper 100% three dimensional illusion. None of this. Auto stereoscopic malarkey you get in the high street or in the cinema. This is proper non vomitizing 3D. Great stuff. However, as you can see, dodecahedrons and cubes, not terribly exciting. Two reasons for that. One is that computing holograms takes a fair amount of oomph on the computer, therefore, there's a computational issue that's kind of being addressed as the infinite excuses of Moore's law race on. The other problem is that there's kind of an information limitation based on this puppy here. This SLM, this pixelated device, has two limitations. It has a number of pixels. That kind of decides how much you can actually diffract the light and control it. It's like a sort of a, a limitation on how much information you can have in your hologram. Quite a complicated relationship to the size of that one. But also the pitch, the periodicity of the pixels. And that very much affects the angle. This angle here, the angle that the light is actually diffracted by. Therefore, how much of the hologram or the view you can see. And at the moment, for a standard off-the-shelf device like we saw yesterday, 
that might be 10 microns pitch, that means you have about a 10 degree viewing angle. That's not a very wide angle. That means you've got to peer into it really carefully to see the image. So therefore, we're limited by this liquid crystal um, device here. Why? Why? Because of this. We have square pixels. We love square pixels. No one knows why we love square pixels, but we do. There's my liquid crystal molecules. There's my top and bottom electrode. There's my parallel plate capacitor, uniform field. That's crystal material, as you already know from Ender's lectures on cells and um, dielectric responses. Problem is, this is rubbish for holograms. Holograms are not made up of square pixels. They're made up of continuously varying refractive index profiles. If you look at a photographic film hologram, which is one of the highest quality holograms you can get, they are not pixelated objects, they are continuously variable distributions of refractive index. The only thing that limits them is the grain size of the photographic film itself. But what I want is a way of essentially recreating that. How can I break this barrier? How can I break this structure to give me a truly three-dimensional uh, refractive index profile? And uh, hopefully, ideally, but not necessarily yet, with sub-micron pitch. So I want to decrease this periodicity below the wavelength or to the wavelength of the light. Therefore, I can diffract at a wider angles. I can get more bang for my holographic buck. Here's my multiple carbon nanotube, as I mentioned earlier. Roughly 50 nanometers of diameter. It's a concentric uh, a tube, a uh, series of tubes of uh, graphene rolled into these uh, um, cylinders. And the reason why we use multi-wall carbon nanotubes, one is that they're a bit more mechanically robust than single wall, which are only five nanometers of diameter. But more importantly, single wall nanotubes, half of all, a third of them uh, are semiconducting, two thirds of them are conducting, or maybe it's the wrong way around, maybe it's a third of semiconducting, two thirds are conducting, I can never remember. So, but there's a chance, basically, that some of them will conduct. And that's perhaps what I want to do. What I need is something that will be guaranteed to be conducting. So I have seven layers, which is why it's 50 nanometers in diameter, seven layers of carbon concentrically. Therefore, there's a pretty good statistical chance that one of those seven layers will be conducting. Therefore, my tube is almost 99.9% .9 likely to be a conducting tube. And that's why I'm very attracted to these systems. And a reference scale, there's my little crystal molecule thinking around the bottom. How do I do it? Well, I haven't got time to go into this in too much detail, but basically we use a controlled chemical vapor de deposition process. We use acetylene as a source of carbon. We use nickel as a catalyst to define a very rapid growth procedure for, um, uh, for the, the graphene. And so what we get is we get a growth where the nickel is much, much faster than on the surface. So therefore, as the, uh, the carbon is deposited, it grows thousands of times faster under the nickel because it's catalyzed. And therefore, I get this vertical pillar growing from the surface of my um, carbon. And that's where our multi-wall carbon nanotube is based. And I can use essentially the photography techniques, now imprinting, imprinting techniques, to define the location of this nickel catalyst, and therefore I can define the location of my multi-wall conduct, conducting um, carbon nanotube. And that's what we're using in this talk today. Here we have a nice 10 micron array of multiple carbon nanotubes grown on a piece of silicon. You can see nice and straight, a little bit pointy at the tips. It's hard to say sometimes what the tip looks like because an electron microscope, these are basically little antennas and therefore they look a bit weird as charged objects and quite difficult to image. So exactly how pointy they are is rather difficult to say in this kind of magnification. But they're nice and straight, parallel, and the periodicity is defined by my lithography process. Why is this exciting? Well, it's exciting because I saw a talk many years ago on field emission displays where they use these things as electron sources, basically you put a field on them, they emit electrons like crazy because they are really, really pointy and 50 nanometers of tip, or even thinner, therefore they can shed electrons very easily, and therefore you can get this uh, electric field profile. So I said, hmm, this looks remarkably like a cell to me, I have a top electrode here, which is 0 volts, bottom electrode here, 10 volts, what happens if I stick a electric crystal in this gap? Well, the answer is it's electric field, therefore the crystal will reorient that, 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 that field, and therefore I'm going to get essentially a refractive index profile which will hopefully match that electric field profile. And we're still trying to figure out exactly what, we, what these things are doing in terms of um, modelling and understanding them in, in more detail. We do a lot of experimental work to see the effects of this process, but the, the understanding of the physics of this is still quite um, uh, uh, primitive, mostly because we don't really completely understand how liquid crystal interacts at the surface of the carbon nanotube. And it turns out when you, when you do modelling, you use like Nigel's Q tensor modelling, you find that, that surface property completely dominates what the, electric, what the electric crystal does in terms of reacting to the electric field profile. So until we actually decipher what's going on at that surface, 
we really can't exactly say what um, these uh, what the local prisoners are doing. We can look at the bulk of the device and have a, a fair idea of what's going on. These two keyboards are going to confuse me. So we make a device like this. I'll show them one, but actually you have lots of multiple carbon nanotubes in an array. I have silicon, I have a, a mirror, an electrode combined in aluminium to allow me to apply bolts. I have a pneumatic crystal. Um, strangely enough, when I look at this under the microscope, without the crystal, I can't see the tube, it's so small, it's not visible under a, an optical microscope. I put a liquid crystal in and suddenly I can see this little black dot, which is about 2 microns in size, which is essentially the tip of the tube distorting the liquid crystal. So it is telling us something what, about what's going on between the, the carbon and the liquid crystal, but we're still not totally clear as to why it's doing it. And then I have a single glass and ITO electrode on top. And typically, there are about 2 to 5 microns in length, um, these, these systems, in a sort of 10 micron thick uh, cell, 5 micron thick cell. So, Question number two, the catastic time. And then these two keyboards are going to confuse me. That profile you saw previously was approximately Gaussian. If I let that onto a refractive index of a material like a liquid crystal, what does a refract Gaussian refractive index profile generate optically? What sort of component <coughs> does it create? Does it create a dislocation in time, space, and reality? Does it create a grating? Does it create a hologram? And well, we all love holograms. Does it create a lens or just make a really nice pretty picture? How's your knowledge of grade index profile structures? Ooh, 29, they're going slow today. People are not, not too. Second slide, I said the answer written on it, you better be able to me. I just realised doing these trick questions at the last minute is never totally clever. How are we doing? 49, 40, go on, number 42, you're out there. Right, 43, huh? New, new player. Oh, that's surprisingly um, even distributed. Most of you, thankfully, 17 of you, have said it was D. And D, if I remember rightly, is the lens. Yep, and you are correct. If you have a Gaussian refractive index profile, that actually forms a grade index lens, for the grin lens, basically. And in three dimensions, that looks like a little <coughs> micro lens element. Um, I like to use a few people that like E. I'm slightly concerned by the grating. Although, if you have multiples of these devices, you could argue that there is a distribution in the refractive index which could look like a grating or a hologram. So none of them are particularly um, uh, totally wrong, but the answer is uh, D, a lens. So what we do, as I said before, we apply electric field, we get a Gaussian um, electric field profile. I'm making an assumption without the in-depth mod modelling knowledge in the background that I'm going to get a completely uniform uh, refractive index profile. And if I assume that's the case, then what I should get is a lens, but it's a lens now that by changing my field of V, I can reconfigure the properties, I can change the distribution of the field, and therefore I can change the properties of my um, <coughs> structure. And that looks like a lens or a lens with a ray, which I can then switch on and off and actually also vary the focal length. Remember, this is all happening within my boring old parallel plate capacitor pixel, but now I've not just got a boring uniform field, I've now got a much more exciting three-dimensional field. So this looks much better for the possibilities of doing things like 3D displays. And that's just to show you a typical array. We actually have groups of multiple carbon nanotubes for reasons that I haven't got time to go into today, but it gives you a slightly more uniform um, refractive uh, you know, electric field profile. Some of them are groups of three, some of them are groups of four. Um, once again, it just depends on the, on the, on the, the growth day more than anything else. But by having a group, you get a slightly more Gaussian -y shape than you do by having a single tube. And here's the very early results we have. You can see these are groups of four. You actually see little, really resolvable dots that are the tips of the tubes that the liquid crystal. And as I apply a field, this is without any um, um, polarizers, this is just purely uh, down the microscope, you can see I'm building up this uh, structure, uh, not quite uniform, not quite symmetric at this stage, but then the positioning of the tubes in the group isn't quite symmetric either. But that is showing the distortion in the uh, the crystal created by that three-dimensional field. But these things are really hard to image. I'll tell you now, it's the biggest challenge we have. They are a three-dimensional distribution of refractive index in an anisotropic media. So therefore, you stick that under a microscope which has a fixed focal depth. You have no idea what you're looking at. You don't want to be looking at the middle, the top, the side, or some average of the device. And it varies with magnification. So the, the, the higher you focus in, the narrower the depth of focus of your microscope. Therefore, the harder it is to view these little things. So, Probably a better way is to try and actually say what well, might be a lens. Let's see if it is a lens. 
And here's the video, this is the this is actually the microscope. What I'm doing is I'm switching the things on and off once every second, and I'm varying the focus of the microscope. And you'll see at one instant you get very bright little dots, that's when it's focusing, then you get blobs where there's a defocusing, and then eventually you go completely out of the focal plane and you've got uh, no optical elements at all. And that's saying that basically within that 10 microns of liquid crystal, I have a variable or switchable micro lens, which at this device is a better one than the previous one. It's much more symmetrical, much more circular. Ignore the crumb that's in the, well, in the pro practice in the, in, the, in the background. So you get nice focusing lenses, and I can switch on and off um, in the system. What's the scale? Uh, these are all 10 microns per to these structures. So there are 10 micron um, um, micro lens array. Um, they have a focal length, unfortunately, of about 15 microns. So they've got a huge F number, but um, we're working on it in, in that respect. Um, that's still the crystal and um, biofringence, among other things. Um, in the system, this is with a standard pneumatic we had uh, in the lab. But it's definitely showing that it has that uh, focal property. So we can make these lenses. This is an interferometric image to show that we have the same um, structure. Get able to look at these pictures. Not terribly exciting, come on. And also, we don't, we don't have to do them on silicon. This is a device that's done on quartz. If it's silicon, it's a reflective device, and actually reflect, the reflective micro lenses are not terribly useful in many applications, whereas a transmissive micro lens array is very useful. So these are the first ever, um, I can't say carbon nanotubes, they're going to be called uh, nanofibers. The tube has to be parallel on its side, and so in the world of nano, if you call that a nanotube, they get very upset. <coughs> this is a nanofiber, because it's slightly conical in shape, it's just because of the growth on this quartz, it's quite difficult, quite fiddly. Um, the growth is quite high temperature, so it's quite difficult to do on substrates like glass, where essentially your catalyst just gets sucked into the, uh, into the glass uh, and diffuses away, whereas on quartz, high temperature uh, works quite nicely. And I know quartz is biofragile for other problems with the optics, but at least it proves that we can do a, uh, a micro lens uh, which is uh, uh, transparent. And so here's an example of a micro lens array uh, being used as, a, as what's called an uh, integral imaging system. I have an object, which is a small um, it's a mask of a letter three, sorry, number three. <clears throat> and this is under the microscope showing the, the micro lenses uh, defocused. And then when I focus them, you can see here I get a focused image. Uh, it's not, not quite uniform across the plane, but there's some nice focused threes there. So it's kind of a bit variable because of the alignment of the sample under the microscope, it's not perfect, etc. But it's showing the, the structure that's in and out of focus. And there's lots of other of these pictures. And this is actually a really nice way of making a three-dimensional camera, what's called a fly's eye camera. Because each one of these lenses is actually taking a slightly different angle of view of that object. Each one of these threes is seen from a different dis displacement, therefore from a slightly different angle. Therefore, that's actually a series of different views of that, three di of that object in three dimensions. And so we actually built and demonstrated a simple three-dimensional microscope system um, camera, which allowed us to view objects um, on samples um, from different angles using this approach. And you can reconstruct a 3D image from these multiple views uh, under the microscope. That's another talk for another time. Um, I mentioned also previously in my uh, introduction that we can get some very interesting uh, scattering effects. And this, this is just kind of a sideline, something we don't understand at all. And these devices, this is also a 10 micron pitch carbon energy array. These are the little elements distorting the crystal. Um, this, is, uh, this is a video, so probably I'll just switch on, switch off. What happens though? When I apply a low frequency field, is you really get this quite um, um, strange electrohydrodynamic effect, which is triggered and, and launched by these um, pointy carbon nanotubes. It only does it for certain arrays under certain conditions, which we don't really understand. So there's something about this particular batch of devices that cause this effect to be very, very dominant. And what's happening between this uh, here, and that's, oh, that's, that's at 100 hertz, and that's, 100, that's 150 hertz. This is a frequency driven effect, not a um, not a, uh, <coughs> a field driven effect, and it's not also a negative dielectric anisotropic material, it's a positive standard pneumatic. Um, but what I think is happening is that these tubes are very, very pointy indeed. This particular batch happened to come out really sharp in the fabrication process, <coughs> and that's giving you really quite strong um, uh, field enhancement of the tip. And that's essentially controlling the uh, liquid crystal in a very um, <coughs> unusual way, as opposed to that uniform field, uh, or that sort of Gaussian field profile. Everything's kind of forced to the tip, and it's very, very intense at the very tip of the tube, giving you this completely unusual and very, very strange um, electric field profile. But uh, 
Still working on what's going on with these devices, but they look lovely. They make really nice scattering devices with very good white surfaces. Um, and uh, I think I'll show you this video. This is just a high magnification. You can see here, it's really unusual property. As I increase the frequency, I get this more and more turbulent uh, flow. And I get, I get, every now and then, I also get these really weird, strange, wiggly things that appear. And once again, due to the structure and the, and the, the tip um, of the actual carbon nanotube distorting uh, the director somehow. And trying to unravel what all these things are doing and what they're actually, what's actually happening in these systems is really a uh, completely unanswered question that we're still trying to uh, figure out. There's lots of things going on that is just beyond my level of uh, uh, pay grade. So, next question. Going back to our complex com um, uh, idea of having a three dimensional holographic system, this is a possible way of doing it. So, what could be the smallest pixel we can achieve in an imaginative crystal? How far can I push this ability to modulate light? This gives me a way of concentrating the electric field, therefore I can hopefully now start to address the electric field very, very high resolution, very, very uh, high pixel pitch. Answer A should be obvious, because you've already seen 10 microns with the micro lenses. What about a micron without point one of a micron without point oh one of a micron? Or oh, nobody knows. Those of you that saw the discussion on the first day, we're going to announce this as well, if you remember that far back a while ago now. 43, we have a winner. Ah, interesting. 100 nanometers. Good <coughs> answer. There's a lot of theory that says 100 nanometers is about right. Correlation distances look crystals. Um, other things, there are devices that have been made down to about 400 nanometers, but they aren't individually addressed pixels. They're sort of like ramps or groups of pixels which are made of little 400 nanometer pieces. Um, but actually, I might we still argue the answer is E. We don't really know. It's one of the questions from an engineering perspective, which is really frustrating. So I don't really know how close I can put together pixels in a crystal device and still have an effective modulator. Because I want to be at the 100 nanometer length scale in order to do my holograms. That's kind of the, the holy grail of doing a holographic system, I think. I will be 100 nanometers. And uh, I still don't really know whether I can achieve that. I, probably, I know I can do A and B. But I don't know about uh, C, D. Um, <coughs> so the answer is probably E, but C is a good, good guess. Nice work, people. And here's an example of an array which went wrong. These are 10 micron, 5 micron, and 3 micron arrays um, put together, and where they overlap because of the, basically the error of the E-beam system, I end up with an array of 1 micron pitch nanotubes. And lo and behold, I can still resolve 1 micron microlenses. So I can still see um, individual elements being controlled by the nonlinear fields at a one micron length scale. So that tells me, with a bit of luck, I should be able to make one micron lens arrays and one micron um, liquid crystal holographic devices. So the liquid crystal is already um, exceeding my expectations based on purely a displays approach where everything seems to be stuck at the, sort of the 5 to 10 uh, micron range. Although Bill said yesterday there's a company now making a 2.5 micron um, uh, Alcos device, which sounds quite exciting. Be very interesting for holographic systems. And this is just another device with another error in it, but you look really carefully here, at this region here, these are essentially one micron part. And what you see is you can get very, very narrow focusing in these areas. The reason why the other bit's not switching is in different lengths. But this particular area here is uh, you can see there's a very, very uh, small amount of focusing going on, and that once again, that focusing of light is happening on a one micron scale. So you can get very narrow confined liquid crystal that drop it. So, how do I get around the problem with the fact that all I can do at the moment is make an array of these darn things. I can make, you know, these things grow all over the place, but I have to switch them as a single electrode. I can't individually address individual carbon nanotubes. And what I really want in my device is this. I want to be able to apply different voltages to different tubes, therefore creating not just a single Gaussian profile, but a series of overlapping Gaussian profiles. And that gets to these things that Bill mentioned yesterday, killer forms, and even better, killer forms that are continuously varying between the pixels. There's no gaps, there's no um, dead spaces, there's no fringing field effects. We can start to build up kind of a <coughs> modal model of how we can build up a, a, a two-dimensional refractive index system pattern uh, using individually addressed multi-wall carbon nanotubes. And that is still in the future, but we've done a few things to try and 
work on this in the way. The idea is that perhaps we have some of this is an Alcos backplane, this is a transistor of a single pixel, and I can enhance that artist impression by growing my carbon nanotubes on the surface of this. And this is an option A, it just turns out unfortunately at the moment. The growth process of the carbon nanotube absolutely destroys the liquid crystal uh, backplane. Therefore, we have to get the temperature of the growth down so that it doesn't basically melt the silicon chip behind it. Uh, that still needs to be done. We haven't come up with a way of getting it below about 400 degrees Celsius at the moment. Um, so and that's just still a little bit too hot for uh, the chip um, to survive all the nice uh, semiconductor properties disappear, all the nice diffused uh, semiconductor properties, you know, it, it, it away. So, um, we haven't yet cracked that particular problem, so we've gone back to more brute force approaches. And just to show you the net benefit, these are models based on console. That's what we've done, that's the, that's the uh, lens array. This is what happens if I just have plus minus plus minus. You can see now, rather than having this sort of Gaussian structure, I've got this kind of almost like sinusoidal uh, periodic structure. And if I have like a grating with a ramp, this is just positive, 4321 volts, you can see I get quite different um, electric field profiles. And some really quite unusually distortions in the electric field here, um, repulsion, etc., between the tubes, which allows me to control the refractive index, hopefully, in a much more sophisticated fashion. Well, this is something which we really want to have, but yet still don't have a way of doing it. Uh, we've tried various approaches. These are carbon nanotubes grown on gold um, <coughs> substrates. And this is a device, you can see this is actually for very reasons. Um, I, have, I can't quite remember, we used a, a cholesteric. Um, materials is a, a, a twisted pneumatic, a helical pneumatic structure. You'll hear more about this afternoon in lasers and Harry's talk. Um, oh, there's, this is one array of tubes here, an array of tubes here. This is a 10 micron gap. And hopefully, you can see this is kind of a purplish color in here. And this is coming a yellowy color here. So, hopefully, what we think is happening is that we're distorting somehow that chiral structure um, between those two walls of tubes. So, that shows that I can actually address the field laterally rather than just vertically from the surface. Then you get really weird things like this. That's just a bigger blown up picture. Then you get really weird things like this. Let me turn the lights off. Ooh. And it's on. Uh, 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 uh. Ah, hey. This is something really weird. This is the same structure. This is actually, remember I mentioned focal conics? In my uh, scaffolding system, this is a the third state of cholesterol that you don't always want, which is when it goes random. And this is essentially the same structure. But you can see here I'm getting quite a lot of um, cholesterol. Like this is the, the band gap that um, Steve and, and Harry will talk about in these cholesterol structures. Um, and that gives you essentially a, a color filter, you know, a gap in the wavelength spectrum. And you can see here that it's coming quite an interesting distorted um, electric field profile. It looks a bit like kind of a, a fire explosion um, uh, from above. And that's uh, coming from these unusual uh, electric field profiles, you turn it off and it all disappears and goes back to the photonic again. So you get this really strange, um, unusual alignment of the, um, the helix in these structures. That's kind of an aside. We tried another approach. We thought, well, okay, we've got this boring single electrode on the bottom substrate. We haven't looked at the ITO on the top, so let's put an ITO electrode on top with different pixels on it so we can maybe control the um, electric field in a bit more sophisticated way between the tubes. And this is essentially that material modelled. And you can see here, it's quite important whether you have the tube in the middle of the electrode or you have the tube in the gap. It gives you really quite different um, electric field profiles. So that's the problem to start with. And then the really fun starts. <laughs> what happens if you make the device? This is once again a 10 micron pitch tube. These little dots for 10 micron tubes. Now you're in the lab. You're making a cell. You've made a cell. You're blue and faces and that sort of lucky. Um, you put the top electrode on top, and now the top electrode has um, 14 micron pitch um, ITO stripes on it, and you have to line them up with the carbon nanotubes that you can't see. So you can't see the carbon nanotubes, and you can't see the ITO. So how on earth do you get this device to line up? Well, the answer is you go and hope it lines up roughly, and that's what you get. You can see it's kind of lined up, um, but there are quite some quite very different variations across the structure. Um, so there's about uh, if that, if that point there was aligned um, with, the, with the gap of the ITO, then it would be about halfway across the, over there. So yeah, there's a little bit of tilt, a little bit of angle, which is why you get this really quite unusual distortion. If you want to talk about disclinations and uh, defects, have a field day. There's enough there to last your lifetime in terms of things you want to try and predict. 
And that's just a slightly higher magnification uh, picture. You can see really quite complex structures, but also very interesting. This kind of control here is getting towards the micron scale distribution I want to be able to do with my holographic system. I want to be able to break this 10 micron square pixel barrier, and here I've got a continuously variable, much higher resolution structure, but at the moment I still can't control it perfectly because of this problem of trying to align these uh, systems. And this is just a video, this is a more complex area. Some totally bizarre things going on here because this is where there's a, a defect in the growth of the process. And these are where the carbon nanotubes have grown normally. And then this is a gap. This is where something went wrong and there's no nanotubes or it's completely black silicon. But yeah, what's going on here? And here, this one here. It's just, I have no idea what's going on in these systems. And even worse, switches. This electric field applied. So you can really get quite complicated, unusual structures um, when you switch these things. And you've got three electrodes to play with, so you've got lots of like, things you can switch. And you can make umpteen million lovely videos, which I've done. But really importantly, here, I'm getting lenses which are confined onto the micron length scale. So I'm really getting features which are getting towards where I want to be with these structures. All these disconnections, all these lovely distortions are all at the micron length scale. But yet I still cannot get the thing to perform um, uniformly because I can't control the fabrication process accurately enough to get everything beautifully lined up and make a single uh, predictable device. Also, when in doubt, bang a laser on it and see what happens to the diffraction pattern. Always a nice result. This is uh, that damn diffraction pattern. So this is just a laser pointer literally being bounced off that device. This uh, periodicity here matches the periodicity of the uh, 10 micron nanotubes. I look what you switch it. That's the diffraction pattern as you're switching it on and off. And you're getting all sorts of complicated, wonderful things going on here. But this here is almost a 45 degree spread of the light. So I'm scattering and bending the light right out to 45 degrees, which confirms my 1 micron uh, pitch periodicity in um, these structures. So I'm expanding my viewing angle. Um, very, very effectively by using these nanotubes to try and shrink and control further. But at the moment, I still don't have the accuracy of the mechanism to control them in a, in a useful way. But it's there or thereabouts. So, what happens next? Well, we can't afford to do VLSI design on a nanoscale, too expensive, and also we still cook the chips. So, what else do you do? Well, you start to mess around with other things. And what happened next was we made a sidestep or a tight shuffle into the mysterious world of metamaterials. Now, next question. What is a metamaterial? <coughs> is it A, cloak of invisibility as popularized by Harry Potter? <laughs> is it a material property not found in nature? Is it a material that needs to the next? Is it a material with bonus features? Or is it just really cool? Of course, option E is by definition the correct answer. You have these buzzwords, but what do they actually mean? Of course, the answer is going to be here. Find out. Thank you, 43. You're in. And what have you got? Oh, no, that's that pile of crap. Sorry, vote again. Two rooms, one stone. Now, look at that. That's how you want to vote. That's what I like to see. Come on, come on. Seven, eight, six, five. Nicky, Nicky. Uh, we lose three. Never mind. I lost three people in ten seconds. That's bad. <laughs> D, C. Sorry. Ah, interesting. Ah, interesting. That seems to have that because you read too many nature papers. No. That is not the definition of method. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, there, are, there are materials that have negative refractive index that are metamaterials, but a metamaterial is not a material that necessarily has a refractive index, if that makes sense. But that's the answer B. It's a material with a uh, property not found in nature. So it's not naturally occurring in that material. You somehow change the properties of the material, usually by some degree pokery of uh, nano uh, feature or printing or, or, or lithography, and that changes the way in which it interacts with the electromagnetic radiation. That's what a metamaterial is. It's, it's negative dielectricity, it's negative permeability, it's negative 
um, contracted index. They can all be tweaked and changed in an unnatural way by playing with the physics of these uh, devices. And the father of all of this in the modern era is this chap, John Pendry. And he came up with a theory which basically took, says if you take a, an array of structures like this, there's a couple of very important features that have to be long. They have to have a, a spacing A and a diameter R. And it turns out that the length is not important as long as they're long. Um, what is important is the ratio of A to R. The ratio of A to R tells us essentially that there's a particular frequency of electromagnetic radiation which will resonate in that structure. I then apply that to the Drude model for so a say something like dielectric uh, constant of permittivity, and I finally get this sign change occurring at a particular resonant frequency when this plasmonic effect takes over. So I can essentially flip the, the sign of the dielectric constant by having a particular structure of a particular size and a particular periodicity. And that's one example of a metamaterial. And there are many, many others. You can change the magnetic field and the permeability, lots of other things like putting curvature, split rings, uh, bow ties, all sorts of funky structures you can make which um, allow you to uh, bend the rules uh, in these structures. But this one, of course, is of interest to me because lo and behold, what's that? That looks remarkably like a uh, array of multiple carbon nanotubes that's grown on a piece of silicon. I mentioned by the way, these are wires, these are conducting, uh, they're conducting rods, they're not, um, they're not uh, dielectric insulators. So if you have an array of these conducting systems, like multiple carbon nanotubes, then you can make some quite interesting things. And one of the things you can do, for instance, is if you have a positive property, then you'll get essentially light propagating through. If you have a negative, then you get non-propagation, you get a forbidden state, and therefore light is reflected from these structures. Now, there's a couple of important things to note here. This is polarization dependent. You know what that means? So I told you what it means. So in other words, the electric field orientation is important with respect to the electric, to the structure of the tube. So in other words, the electric field has to excite the electrons in the structure in such a way that you get this plasmonic resonance. So if I apply a field which is vibrating in this direction, I'll see nothing at all. So if my electric field is this way, I'll get no effect because there's nothing, there's no parallel tubes in that particular direction. So it's also important you get the polarization of your light or uh, your energy uh, correct with respect to these structures. By the way, I'm giving you a turbo introduction to these things. We haven't got time to go into the detailed uh, physics. This is a nice Heidelberg model of this. And you can see here this is the array of multiple carbon nanotubes where I've got 50 nanometer diameter, because it's a multiple carbon nanotube, which you already know, and a periodicity of 0.4 micron, 40 nanometers. And you can see here, I have two different orientations of my electric field. When it's parallel, I get this nice plasmonic resonance with a very strong, sharp cutoff of omega p, which in this case uh, coincides with 1.4 microns, just in the middle of the telecoms into red band. Whereas I show the other orientation of the electric field, and I get nothing. I get this nice dip here, this is essentially Bragg diffraction um, from the periodicity of the structure, but that's got nothing to do with this particular process. What I don't get is any nice, sharp, plasmonic uh, cutoff. So, can I do this in reality? Well, of course the answer is yes. Because while we were growing these 10 nanotube um, arrays, my stunning student Chin was busily in the clean room making 0.4 micron nanotube arrays, and that's a high, high magnification high magnification and very close up. Also pointing out here, note this little blobs on top. That's actually the nickel catalyst ball. The nickel, nickel, nickel process, nickel is not actually um, touched by the growth process, it just catalyzes the carbon growth. So you end up with a tube with a little ball sticking on top. That's why the little funny round caps on them. And you get occasionally the odd wonky one. But the majority of them, you get the odd bit of mank in here as well. But the majority of them are growing nice and parallel, long enough and the right size to behave in the uh, world of Pendry. Problem is these are really nightmare things to actually analyze, so Hyder and the guys in the Cavendish next building over actually spent quite a lot of time trying to measure these things. They took that array and they had to essentially get a variable wavelength source, which so is essentially an electric field incident in this direction here. So they had this sort of optical stage system and a, um, a launch system and a uh, um, <coughs> detection uh, um, spectrometer, and they had one of these really lovely multi wavelength uh, um, lasers, you know, white light laser thingies, continuum thingies, and they could essentially vary the angle of incidence. 
They couldn't quite get down to theta equals 90 degrees because that would be essentially trying to shine light there's about a micron high into the edge of the stuck structure. Very, very difficult to do um, physically. So they got to about, about 70 degrees, I think, from Riley uh, angle. And that's enough to have the majority of the electric field uh, entering of the right orientation and to show uh, the plasmonic effect. And physicists love these band gap plots, which I still don't understand to this day. But this is a plot, it's also even worse, it's an EV. Uh, it's worse than, I thought it was bad as wave numbers, which is what chemists use, but even more cryptic. But uh, this is essentially, this is the engineer's view, angle this way, uh, wavelength that way, so it's visible, to so infrared, basically. And you can see here, this is unpolarized light, so you get this diffraction um, arrangement here. This is essentially the perpendicular polarized light, once again, my diffraction curve. This is the high angle here, so I'm starting to get that dip we saw in the model. And then, in my, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> in my parallel to the tubes um, light, you can see I'm getting this huge area here where I'm getting low reflection, I'm getting resonance from my system, and therefore I'm getting that plasmonic cutoff um, from my analysis. Yeah. And so that's just the experimental replication of it. This is the perpendicular, this is the parallel, there's my plasmonic resonance, etc. I don't quite know what's going on this bit here. This is the, uh, the perpendicular um, part of the, uh, the, uh, the way. It's probably something to do with the alignment and the problems we have with actually getting light into these uh, structures. And then, and let's just compare that with the model. So, before and after. And once you've got that, then you can do really clever things. You can change the periodicity, and therefore you can guide and select certain wavelengths and do clever things with them. Um, with this plasmonic effect. And we made a device like this. I'll whip through this. Um, it's had this, uh, this defect or this gap in it which had twice the periodicity, therefore changes the plasmonic resonance. And this is the, the structure here. This is my perpendicular. This is my parallel. You can see there's a dip which occurs. This, this is essentially the inverse of, um, oops, of this peak. Here, this is the selective band that gets transmitted around this corner here. Because of the reflection rather than transmission, you get the inverse of it. So you get a notch, which represents the guided modes that are being collected by that plasmonic structure. And I can make uh, super lenses, I can change the laws, and I can change the laws of physics the way lenses work. I can make refractive things or defractive, etc. Which is the clever things with these structures. And that's an example of a super lens uh, which has been fabricated once again using the vertically grown carbon nanotubes. I will probably, oh, I just mentioned, I mentioned hologram. Please. I can also <laughs> change the periodicity of these things. They're not just periodic arrays, but they've got an array which actually represents a pattern. Going back to what Bill said, to have a hologram, and I had the Fourier chops from generating a pattern. Why don't I put that pattern here, use this to represent the growth position of the tubes, and see what happens. Pretty much a cool idea. And that's the tubes as seen from above. This is essentially the number of electron microscopes. They're glowing, they're, they're charged um, objects. Um, really weird, and that's the tubes. Uh, really weird, we're looking at an optical microscope. We're now kind of in the regime where we're getting diffraction as well. We want the white lights, so you get some really quite complex patterns to try and analyze there. But really cool, if we dance the laser off them, you get a really nice uh, hologram and a really nice replay field being generated. You can see here, this is a 70 degree diffraction angle, very, very wide angle diffraction, because I've now got these structures down to the nanometer uh, length scale. One thing we don't completely understand, but we're starting to get the hang of now, is that this thing is 10 times more efficient than it should be. If you base it purely on an amplitude hologram, where the tips are essentially absorbing the light, then it should be 3% efficient, but this is more like 30% efficient, so therefore there's some plasmonic enhancement going on. In other words, the interaction of the light between the tubes is actually creating uh, a phase change, which is giving us uh, more of a holographic effect than we just see purely from an amplitude hologram. So we're, still, we're getting not only plasmonic interactions along the length of the tube, we're also getting plasmonic um, uh, reactions across the width of the tube as well. And um, Uniman uh, did a, uh, a sort of modelling to show that was possible um, a few months ago to, uh, to, to prove the effect um, was at least feasible. It still doesn't quite explain the factor of 10, but it explains why we get a lot more light back from our hologram than we expect purely from the basic model. And you can also get these quasi-crystal structures that have these beautiful um, diffraction colours and patterns. 
um, from these structures. And I think I'll probably stop there. But that's the next question we're trying to answer at the moment. Can I combine the liquid crystals um, with these structures just to show you? Uh, I won't go into that, but these are just pictures of liquid crystal devices. This is the 400 nanometer array in other tubes um, with liquid crystal VLO48 on top, another 5 micron gap, applying the field. But I can get these really quite unusual colour uh, changes and switching effects that we're at the moment trying to figure out exactly what these things are doing. Um, we don't really know the liquid crystal in between the nanotubes tubes or not, whether they've actually filled the array or whether it's just sitting on top of some sort of hydrophobic um, type process. So uh, watch the space. I'll stop there. Which is about 100 yards to the right. I was just wondering, would you get better quality control if you sent it off to a company to do that for you? No, probably not. We're probably the, the machine that we use, which is Black Magic, is developed in our lab. It's now commercialised by Axtron and make commercial fab equipment. But we have the kind of the, the know-how, the, the ground zero knowledge of how these machines work. So I, I'd argue we probably do it better than anyone else at the moment in this growth process. <laughs> but I don't think so. And also, if you were trying to control your voltage to each tube individually, couldn't you, like, uh, just like print different little silicon squares under each tube? Like, with, with How would you address them? Though? You somehow got to get the, the field on there. We've done some wire devices, which are just one-dimensional wires on tungsten, because you can grow tubes on tungsten quite easily. Kind of worked, kind of didn't work. Very difficult, something being short-circuited. You know, we made them with 100 nanometer spacing. Very hard to make. A grating is 100 meters spacing where they're not shorting each other out somehow. One tube has to just fall over and you've got yourself a short. Out of a big area is quite, quite likely. Uh, it's not a question, it's more of an observation and comment. It sounds like you have the, um, uh, the structure of the electronics down pretty well <coughs> and it's getting better very quickly. But if you really want to reduce um, the size down to say 10 nanometers, let alone 100. It sounds like you need to do a lot of chemistry here to get materials with much smaller elastic constants and more electrically and optically responsive materials. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, it's, uh, we're using materials that have been built for the standard display industry and offshoots thereof and various experimental you know, research, but nobody's made a material that's been designed for this process. So yeah, there's going to be some uh, custom chemistry, perhaps why we have pet chemists in our in our group, who is uh, at some point going to have the spare time to do this. Collaborations. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very important. But the moment we don't really quite know what we're looking for in the material to know, uh, it's very hard to get a cohesive argument as to what the important parameters are on a lip crystal material in terms of what controls its, uh, the size of a pixel. So you get lots of different stories. Here we're talking about uniform areas or disclinations or defect. There's lots of different things that could possibly be dominant in this structure. I mean, I see this as essentially a controlled defect structure. I'm actually creating defects in a controlled manner, using them as my diffractive elements, rather than uh, having them as an unwanted thing, which appear in the sideline of a, of a structure. So, you know, I don't really know enough about the crystal materials yet to know what the right answer to that uh, uh, observation is, but you're definitely correct. We need to do some materials uh, design as well as just playing with the engineering of these structures. So, uh, I'm not using the used in the present study. Uh, was the functionalized or uh, used as it is? Sorry, sir. Uh, were they functionalized or not? Functionalized? No. Just straight good old carbon. So, uh, not how, even annealed. How they got a straight pattern uh, with the field or anything? Uh, they're grown, the black cat, sorry, good black cat. The black magic system is a chemical vapor deposition system, so it creates a plasma, but it does it in a way you can apply a uniform electric field. So there's about 600 volts of, uh, of electric field applied across this building with a shower head on top, which is where the gas comes down and creates the plasma. That's also at, at a high voltage potential. So the tubes grow nice and straight. There's a guy from Ken Tio about 10 years ago who perfected this technique of growing these tubes beautifully vertically. I mean, that very first picture I showed you way back at the beginning, 
is a, is a, is a stolen from the Kentio picture. Um, and that's, that, these are the tubes he grew when he first, first developed this process. And it's because of that uniform electric field, there's a, a, a graphite base that you grow the, uh, you put a sample on top of, and that is your, is your ground um, connector, and you have 600 volts in your shower here, and you get this really nice uniform growth. And they can grow very tall. We've grown them, you know, millimetres long. They start to wobble a bit in the, in the sort of the thermal fluctuations of the plasma by then, because they're quite hot when they're growing, but uh, they still come out pretty straight. The problem when they're very close together is that they tend to do this, they tend to touch each other. There's some sort of attraction at sort of the nanometer length scales. So we grew a lot of samples which would do that in a random kind of way. And that's what um, Ching perfected in this process, was how to get the gas pressures and temperatures right so that they grew nice and straight, but at a sort of a 400 nanometer. And that's about the limit. We never got below 400 nanometers yet. I mean, you can do the lithography down to 50, but <clears throat> the tubes just grow together if you grow them at that, that kind of uh, periodicity.